Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. During the late Carboniferous, as the amniotes were beginning their radiation, one particular and very successful lineage emerged. These were the sauropsids, the sister lineage of the early synapsids that we looked at in the last video. Sauropsida at this time encompassed the common ancestors of what we would consider reptiles today, including the squamates, tuatara, turtles, and archosaurs. The birds, once considered to be their own separate lineage, are now acknowledged as derived members of Archosauria, being the sole group of living dinosaurs, and therefore a part of Sauropsida as well. This is nothing to say of the numerous totally extinct lineages, such as the Ichthyosaurs and Sauropterygians. Despite all of this later diversity, the most ancient Sauropsids were small and relatively marginal lizard-like animals that inhabited the humid swamp forests of the Carboniferous world. Living alongside massive arthropods and their synapsid cousins, which they would have been difficult to distinguish from in life, the first sauropsids emerge in the fossil record roughly 312 million years ago. Possessing relatively uniform teeth, unlike synapsids, it was once thought that all of the ancestral sauropsids lacked openings at the rear of the skull. This trait clearly separated them from the proto-mammals, which fairly consistently had a single opening behind each eye. However, it has come to be acknowledged that several lineages of early sauropsids did indeed possess single skull openings, making the ancestral condition in amniotes unclear. Traits that were likely present in these animals would also have included colour vision and the possession of dry, non-glandular scaly skin composed of keratin B, similar to the keratin A of our hair and fingernails. The most basal of all sauropsids were possibly the mysterious mesosaurs, a group of semi-aquatic animals known from the early Permian. These were the first of the sauropsids to return to an amphibious ecological niche, being superficially lizard-like animals with elongated narrow snouts, numerous needle-like teeth and flattened tails. They have long been thought to have been coastal forms that probably inhabited relatively shallow water, but recent research suggests that at least those from Uruguay inhabited a hypersaline environment. Recently described embryos show that the pachyrostris of the ribs, which were thicker and denser than those in terrestrial tetrapods, developed even before hatching, which suggests that mesosaurs were able to swim at birth or shortly thereafter. The main prey items for mesosaurs seem to have been small crustaceans, which would have been snapped up in the animal's long jaws. Three genera have so far been described, with Mesosaurus itself being the most famous. Native to the early Permian of Namibia and Brazil between 299 and 280 million years ago, Mesosaurus measured about 1 meter or 3.3 feet long and possessed webbed feet, a streamlined body and thickened ribs suggesting a semi-aquatic lifestyle. The jaws were narrow, with nostrils located at the tip of the snout as in modern crocodilians, allowing Mesosaurus to breathe while remaining submerged in the water. Known from multiple specimens, including the oldest known amniote fetuses ever described, suggest that Mesosaurs were ovoviviparous, with the egg developing inside the mother's body until the young were ready to hatch. Examinations of the hatchling specimens suggest that the young were adept swimmers from birth, being more heavily adapted for life in the water than the adults. Fully grown Mesosaurus individuals may have been capable of moving about on land, but in a limited way, crawling up the shoreline like living turtles do. Two additional genera are known, with these being Brazilosaurus and Stereosternum, also from the same region and time period. The latter is far better preserved, with coprolites associated with the genus containing crustacean shells and the bones of juvenile mesosaurs, indicating cannibalism in these animals. Although often thought of as shallow water dwellers, both Mesosaurus and Stereosternum fossils have been found in black shale deposits, indicating that Mesosaurs were capable of entering deeper waters up to 490 feet below the surface. The classification of Mesosaurs has always been rather controversial. Some individuals of the genus Mesosaurus have been suggested to have possessed a fenestre on the lower jaw, a feature that was considered to be unique to synapsids. However, the presence of skull openings in sauropsids is highly variable and have been gained and lost multiple times in different lineages. Current studies place mesosaurs as either the most basal of all sauropsids or as basal members of Parareptilia, a highly diverse group of early reptiles that deserve a video in their own right. Moving past the mesosaurs and their possible parareptile relatives, all other sauropsids are part of the enormous clade Eureptilia, 
the so-called true reptiles. An early diverging and successful group of you reptiles were the Capturinids, which had a cosmopolitan distribution across Pangaea and thrived between the late Carboniferous and the late Permian. These were generally squat, lizard-like animals with proportionally large, robust skulls that lacked temporal fenestrae. Capturinid jaws were powerful, with early basal forms tending to be rather small and insectivorous, possessing single rows of teeth, while later and more derived genera had up to 11 rows of crushing teeth, useful for processing tough plant material. Most species were modest, with the majority being similar to bearded dragons in terms of size, and possessed a distinctive hooked tip at the end of the upper jaw. The derived subfamily Moradisaurinae were generally larger and more heavily built, being devoted herbivores. Moradisaurus itself was the most massive of all Capturinids, measuring up to 1.5 metres or about 5 feet long, and was native to Niger during the late Permian. With a massive triangular skull comprising about a quarter of the animal's total length, Moradisaurus and its close relatives Gansurhinus and Labidosaurikos would have been low browsers that fed on ferns and cycads while watching out for thorapsid predators. Like some modern herbivores, Moradisaurus was capable of defending itself by utilising its powerful jaws as a dangerous weapon. In all, Capturinids were somewhat comparable to modern iguanas and agamids, being the first mainly herbivorous family of sauropsids. More derived U reptiles fell into the clade Romerida, which contained some of the most ancient of all sauropsids. Early members of Romerida continued to lack openings in the skull and tended to be less specialised than that of the Capturinids, being small and lizard like animals. A typical example was a genus Paleothyris from the late Cretaceous of Nova Scotia, an agile insectivore measuring about 30 centimetres or 12 inches long. This genus possessed large eyes, which suggests a nocturnal lifestyle. Known from a well-preserved specimen that lacked only the tail, Paleothyris had jaws lined with small sharp teeth, with a pair of pseudo-canines in the upper jaw. A closely related and far more famous genus was Hylonomus, being the oldest known sauropsid so far described, also native to Nova Scotia, but at an earlier date circa 312 million years ago. Hylonomus was a lizard-like insectivore, measuring about 20 centimetres or 8 inches long. Fossils of the genus have been found in the remains of ancient club moss stumps in the Joggins Formation. It is supposed that, after harsh weather, the club mosses would fall down, with the stumps eventually rotting and hollowing out. This would make an ideal place to make a nest, which then succeeded in preserving the animals once they perished inside. Within a similar space on the sauropsid phylogenetic tree were the Varanopids, at least according to certain recent studies. Often considered to be basal synapsids, these carnivorous, superficially monitor lizard-like animals measured up to six feet long and were agile, widespread predators. Like some mesosaurs and parareptiles, Varanopids possessed a single opening behind each eye, which served as an anchor point for powerful jaw muscles. These were the smallest of the Permian's carnivore guild, with larger synapsid carnivores such as Dimetrodon and Therapsids being dominant. The earliest known member of the family, Archaeovenator, was native to the late Carboniferous of Kansas. At the same time, and in the same state, about 302 million years ago, the very first of the true diapsid reptiles emerged. These are grouped together into the clade Aeroscilidea, and had developed two temporal fenestrae behind each eye, a feature that would persist in many later sauropsid groups, including squamates, archosaurs, and even ancestral turtles. Still modest and lizard-like, Aeroscilideans were all less than one metre, or three feet three inches long, being distinguished from the many other similar-looking animals of the time by their more slender limbs, longer tails, and of course, their two temporal openings. The most well-known was the genus Petrolacosaurus, a 40 centimetre or 16 inch long animal that chased after a variety of insect prey on the swampy Carboniferous forest floor. The teeth were small and sharp, while the jaws were relatively weak but were capable of quick snapping motions, perfect for snacking on scuttling arthropods. A close relative, Spinoaqualis, was also an inhabitant of ancient Kansas at the very end of the Carboniferous. A semi-aquatic genus with a deep flattened tail and elongated hind limbs, fossils of this animal have been preserved alongside those of marine fish, suggesting that Spinoaqualis sometimes ventured out into the sea to hunt. 
these early diapsids would survive into the Permian, before giving rise to the more derived neodiapsids, to which all modern reptiles, including birds, belong. So, as we have seen, the Permian may be thought of as the age of synapsids, but their sauropsid cousins thrived alongside them in a variety of ecological niches, reminding me somewhat of the mammals during the Mesozoic. Of course, the sauropsids would truly enter the limelight after the end Permian mass extinction, quickly rebounding after the extinction of the large synapsids, but that is a story for another time. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will cover more of the Notasusians and their rise to success during the Cretaceous in Gondwana. See you again soon. Cheerio.